oh, I sort of, I don't, I sort of feel now I can, I can push the show to a different place. Neil Channing, what entertainment he always is. My thanks to him. I'm joined now by a Luck on Sunday regular. It is great to welcome him back to the studio. Classic winning trainer, Rafe Beckett. He's currently the chair of the Flat Trainers Committee on the National Trainers Federation. He is also the president-elect of that body. And I'm very interested to know how his presidency might impact upon that organisation on the Horsemen's Group and where he feels now the sport is going as we approach the 11th month of racing since the resumption on June the 1st. Rafe Beckett, good morning. Good morning, Nick. Good to see you again. Last time we had an exchange on this programme, it was um, it was at times quite a, a spiky one as we approached the resumption of racing last year on the on the 1st of June. You you stuck your neck out during that period and were pretty critical of the, of the BHA under its then boss, Nick Rust. How do you reflect on that passage of play now? Uh, I don't regret any of it. Um, I think it would have played out very differently if uh, everything that was written in that email exchange had been leaked. Right. When you say it would have played out very differently, how well, do you mean? Um, we might have to refresh people's memories here because this was a, an email exchange that was part leaked to the Daily Telegraph at the time. Um, and you were quite heavily involved at the time, but you were the only trainer who was really prepared to come out and talk, talk publicly about it. Yeah, that's not entirely true. Mark, as you remember, did. Mark Johnson, Johnson did yeah. as well. Um, I remember, what I remember be most about it was that uh, three trainers' comments were leaked. Mm -hmm. The fourth one wasn't. And I'm certain that if his comments had been leaked, the reaction from the media would have been very different because of the media's relationship with him. So the media's relationship with that said trainer, who was part of a critical body of trainers who were criticising the then BHA leadership because he was left out of the league, you felt that the media were quite, quite happy to attack you on the BHA's behalf, but would have taken perhaps the horseman's side, had it been for his I don't knowledge know if, of his inclusion. I don't know if, if they'd taken the horseman's side, but they would have taken a very different uh, view. It would have been a much more objective view. OK. In, 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 I think, you know, Mark and I would both agree on that. Uh, the third trainer withdrew his comments. The BHA asked me to withdraw my comments and apologise. The funny thing I always thought, well, the amusing thing about that was that uh, they didn't ask Mark. <laughs> they didn't even tell Mark. I told Mark that it was being leaked. OK. Um, but anyway, that's, it's, it's history now, but that's, that's, uh, that's, I, I'm confident in that opinion. It's history, but it's an important, it's an important point of context, because at the time, you and other people uh, who are practitioners were trying to force a course of action, really, and to try and, um, I guess, energise the BHA as we approach the resumption of racing. Do you think you made a difference to getting us started on June the 1st? Uh, my personal view is that there are people who believe that we did. I, I would take a more objective view again, you know, it's, it was, certainly wasn't about what, uh, what about Mark and I. My personal view is that, that France starting first was a greater factor. And I also felt that um, uh, you'll remember that the Premier of Victoria commented publicly that the Queen had congratulated them on continuing racing through through the pandemic and uh, he made that point in an interview and my personal view is that that carried most weight. That's a, a very interesting observation. Do you think when racing did resume on, on June the 1st that the BHA did a, a good job? I think people in the BHA did a good job, yes. So who's done well? I think Richard Wayman did very well. You know, as you remember, Nick, I was, Charlie Parker and I were, for, Charlie Parker for the owners and I were part of the resumption group. I think, uh, 
I think that, that as I said at the time, there was a disconnect between uh, the chief executive and the executive underneath. Uh, I think that there are certain people who did a did a very good job. Richard for one. I think Brandt did a good job as well. I think uh, Dr. Jerry Hill did a good job. You know, there were lots of them who 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 were who were punching you know, way up, if not above their weight, doing their very, very, very best to get it going again. And I, um, uh, you know, I saw that firsthand. Mm -hmm. So the sport in some senses has been luxuriating in the notion that it, the industry, has done a good job keeping the show on the road mm. since the 1st of yeah. June. Um, beyond that and underneath that, um, veneer, where are the significant cracks, do you think? Oh. Well, I think that uh, I think that the BHA uh, is has, has too many people for a start. 350 people is employees is too many. It's an uh, it's become an unwieldy body, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Uh, the I think the race courses are doing the sport a disservice. Not least because any initiative that is suggested is blocked by them. Um, from the. The best example I have of that is last year, you'll remember that on resumption, the, the st there were only allowed to be two stalls handlers pushing mm -hmm. horses in. Initially, yeah. Initially. And you'll remember that there are a bunch of older handicappers who are refusing to go in the stalls. Growl, on his 52nd start on the day racing resumed at, New at Newcastle, refused to go in. So as a, as a result of this, it was clear that there weren't enough, the, 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 the loading process was taking too long and horses were refusing to go in because they were hanging around too long watching other horses taking longer to load than normal. That's what horses do. Right. So I proposed that from 14 runners and up, there should be two extra stalls handlers. It should go from 11 to 30. And the race course is blocked it. Why? Wait. The BHA then said that they would pay for a month's trial. And the race course is still blocked it. Because it was set a precedent that would then cost them money. But that's, the, a, that's a fact, Nick. But Racecourse executives, particularly those, when we talked with Richie Galway earlier, particularly those whose business model is based on big crowds, big festivals, are losing money hand over fist during COVID. They'll say, look, you can't expect us to be, to well, be dipping in here when <coughs> we've got no money. And some of these racecourses have, have told you how close they've been to going to the wall. The, Do you really tracks, believe that? Perth and Newton Abbotts of this world. Do you really believe that? Tell me why I shouldn't believe that. Because they're getting between 10,000 and 12,000 a race. Sorry, yes, 10,000 and 12,000 a race. They're getting around 1,000 quid a runner. That hasn't stopped. They're not having to put in place the infrastructure to have a crowd. Some of these small independent race courses have done extremely well. They'll deny that, but they are doing very well. Out of, they have done very well racing through COVID with no crowds. And have you got data and evidence yes. to back that up? Yeah. So put some meat on the bones for me, Ray. And for those who aren't familiar with how race courses are financed, just give us a bit more detail. We, I came on this programme two years ago and said that they were getting £1,000 a runner. That hasn't changed. You know, they're still getting that. Without a crowd, you don't have to, you don't have to have the the, the employees to attend, to, to look after a crowd of sometimes only 1,000 or 1,500 people, sometimes less. 
That's saving them a lot of money. They use the furlough scheme extremely well, ARC. And the idea in particular, we know that, you know, the ground at Lingfield and Yarmouth on resumption last year was, you know, they had to row back pretty quickly to get it in, in, uh, suit, uh, fit for racing, you know, because they laid off grounds and etc. cetera. Um, you know, that was a fact. They admitted that. Um, <clears throat> so you don't have to be a mathematician, and I'm not, to 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 work out that you know the the big independents have suffered, undoubtedly. And when you're talking uh, big independents, you're talking the York, likes of York, Goodwood, Goodwood Newbury. Yeah, they've suffered, but I don't believe for a second that the Jockey Club or or Arc. All the small independents have suffered, not for a second. But the interesting thing is that the, the commercial motivation of each of those groups is, is somewhat different, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, you know, <laughs> Martin Crudus, who's a friend of mine, wants to race from 10.30 in the morning till 8 o'clock at night to maximise maximize profit and... You know, I, we all understand that, but that doesn't serve, in my view, that doesn't serve the sport well. You know, I don't think the race courses have served the sport well. I don't think they've se s sold the sport well at all. You know, there was a memorable article in in uh, race horses of 2019 that Timeform wrote that described, you know, the 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 race to to encourage those who who weren't interested in the sport to come racing. And all that resulted in was uh, a, fixtures being shoved towards the weekend and after racing concerts, which disenfranchised the core audience, you know, and resulted in, in, in race courses losing half a million race goers in the five years pre-COVID. Half a million they lost. So um, I don't think, you know, I think the race courses have, have blocked progress mm -hmm. rather than enhanced pre COVID, and they're bl still blocking progress now, in my view. Okay, how are they blocking progress now? Well, in the sense that. Um, they're not giving nearly enough to prize money, in my view. You know, they could be giving a lot more and it wouldn't touch the sides. We How know from their media rights, we know that. How do you explain the situation that's, that's unfolded over the last two or three days where you've got smaller tracks like Ripon putting on relatively decent prize money, no runners? Well, um, this afternoon, not really many runners at a couple of flat fixtures. There's some quick ground around. Last weekend, Newbury, Marquee Day, not brilliant prize money for the horses on offer. Tons of runners. Doesn't well, stack up, does it? If you're a race course executive, you say, well, these guys will all race for peanuts. I think and when we put on a decent prize, they won't run. I think that, but there are, there are layers to this. Ripon, for example, and Salisbury today can't have overnight runners. So they can't have overnight stayers at the moment yeah. because of COVID. Yeah. Mm. You know, yesterday at, uh, at Ripon, there were f four runners from Newmarket and none from the south of England. That's, that, to an extent, answers that question. I had entries at Ripon and didn't send them for that reason. Uh, and Salisbury, again, will have suffered for the same reason today. Uh, I agree. You know, I... I had a runner in the Spring Cup, which was a diabolical prize, really, for the standard of race it was, how competitive it was. Was it 15,000 to the winner? I mean, that's really, really poor for a race of that standard. And, and I rang my horse's owner in the morning. I said, I don't really, you know, of declarations, I said, I don't really want to run but there isn't anything else for him for a while unless I do. I think Ripon, for example, today, 
oh sorry yesterday they were competing in a week when there was plenty of opposition for those great level of races you yeah. know and that again comes to the point that you know the horse population is no longer fitting the program despite the BHA's race planning department's best efforts you know I'm the trainer on the race planning group a flat trainer and it's pretty clear that you know we've been papering over the cracks for the last five years in terms of making the horse population fit the program by basing it entirely on data you know the race program now is based on the data that feeds it you know well how well, else well, how else are you supposed to devise a race exactly, program with, exactly if you're not devising it with it, it wasn't before evidence. it wasn't before believe me you know the race program was basically influenced by the race courses if they had a race that didn't fill they cut the race is that a good policy no so uh, what's the right policy well the right policy is to is to do what the 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 the, uh, the, the race planning committee have done uh, for July for example they've taken seven two-year-old maiden stroke novices out of the program because the data says that there won't be enough two-year-olds to fill the two-year-old program in July mm. and that 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 of course needs to happen but of course the race courses won't let go of their fixtures because they own most of them but the BHA do own some fixtures and in my view two things will happen sooner or later and I think this is the year it will happen is that uh, race courses will have to start competing for runners and we I, I and I'm sure many others have been looking forward to this this time this is really what's going to in my opinion change I think another thing that needs to happen is that is that uh, the way levy money is distributed has to change it's been distribu distributed by fixture since the 60s that's all wrong in my view okay so how do you change it what you do is you say to the race courses how many a race course how many class threes are you prepared to run this year and when they say we'd like to run half a dozen or whatever it is that you then say okay you can have X for those half a dozen class threes and uh, you'll get Y if you match funded right so you're you're asking for them to make a, a significantly higher prize money exactly. contribution to their to their own purses but How the problem with that Nick of course is that there are race course representatives on the levy board and you know again they'll do their best to block that so how do you feel then about Charlie Parker's idea and he was a guest on the show a few weeks ago he's the uh, president of the race or owners association he's also the chairman of the horsemen's group of which you will now be a, a significant part how do you feel about his idea that the entire structure of, uh, of racing's governing body isn't isn't fit for purpose this tripartite agreement whereby the race courses and the um, trainers owners horsemen call them what you will are these sort of unlikely bedfellows trying to um, coexist and run the BHA as this sort of unpowerful mediator or well I think mediator. he's exactly right I think he's exactly right it needs changing um, <laughs> and it looked like being changed at one point last year or the year before and it got blocked again um, and there are a number of reasons why that got blocked so why did that get blocked well the, the jockeys association blocked it but right. there was more than a suspicion that the chief executive of the time blocked it as well because it was going to affect him directly you know I think the BH board, a board the idea that a board that runs this sport has a retired policeman a buyer from for Waitrose and a champion rower um, as and 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 uh, Maggie Carver for the race, race courses, course association who is a 
who's from television, effectively, wasn't she, uh, are running the sport, you know, it's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. You know, Charlie Parker and Luca Kamani spend a large chunk of their time explaining how the sport works. But let me just pick you up on, on each of those people and, and sort of give you what, what their credentials are. The, the rowing reference was to the, the chair, Anna Marie Phelps, who's got a long and distinguished history in sports administration. Julia Harrington has been a former racecourse executive. She's currently the chief executive of the BHA, a senior racecourse executive, has got a background in racing. I agree. And has also gone to another sport for context and run that very successfully. So I agree. You would agree that she is she is she, she credentialed. She, yeah, absolutely. She is definitely uh, somebody who knows so how the sport works. So she's the most senior executive yeah. within the BHA. Yeah. The other three people you refer to are non-executives. Yeah. Isn't the point of a non-executive board as a, a check and balance to bring context and experience from a wider field of business and sports administration? Otherwise, it all becomes as. Um, one of my colleagues put it the other day, this, this sport marking its own homework. The, that, that obviously is a good point, but you have to have some knowledge of way, the way the sport works. You have to have some feel for the participants and the constituents of the sport. You know, it's my view, Nick, that the for example, the, 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 the BHA and the race courses are all far too close together. You know, Nick was fond of saying, and I like Nick, by the way. Nick Rust. Yeah. He was fond of saying, the race courses often accuse me of being too close to the horsemen. Well, the New Year's Honours list would indicate slightly differently in my view, you know. Just remind he, me. He and Maggie Carver and Nigel Payne all appeared on a New Year's Honours list. And between them, they've got only a decade's service to the sport. So how do you think that happened? Or why do you think it happened? Who knows? But what I, what I would say is that the two winning most trainers this country's ever hang on, produced... You hang on, you can't, I'm not sure you can get away well, with it. Who knows? You, you know exactly what I'm saying. You've just advanced like you've, a significant... You've, 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 well, I actually don't, because well. I can't quite work out what joins the dots. You've advanced like a fairly significant conspiracy theory about why people might have received New hmm. Year's honours. Well, I mean, this isn't that interesting to most people. No, in fairness, it isn't. But it's a, what, the point you're trying to make is that you know, there is a sort of political nexus which is excluding the participants in the sport. And if you're going to throw a point like that out, you know, you've got to back it up with something, I think. OK. The two winning most trainers this country has ever produced have never appeared on the New Year's Honours list. Mm. Mark Johnson and Richard Hannan. But presumably that's because, and I don't know how these things work, but presumably that's because whoever lobbies on behalf of administrators exactly. is a better lobbyer of, of the Honours Committee than the people who... I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, isn't, but the point you're trying to make, is the, is the point that you're trying to make that, that, that this is an example of, however spurious it is, of the participants being excluded at the top table? Is that the point you're trying to make? I think they're being marginalised, yeah. Or the race courses certainly are trying to marginalise them. I think we all think that. Isn't there a bit of responsibility on the part of the horseman to stand up and say, I mean, I hate using the word horseman, but it is the, it is the term that we've been, uh, we've been, I mean, and it's not even a historical term either. It's something that was kind of foist on us, I don't know, about 15, 20 years ago. But um, isn't, the, isn't the onus on the participants to be better represented, to be represented more strongly by people like you? But the structure needs to change for that to happen, as Charlie Parker alluded to. But you're supposed to have ex ex the equal power within the within the uh, structure of the sport as the as the race courses. To how well we is don't your power though, not do being we? Manifest? The, we don't though, do we? Go because on. the horsemen, the horsemen are the breeders, the stable staff, the owners, and the trainers. Mm -hmm. and the race course, uh, you know, we get one representative for all of them, and the race courses get one representative in return. And the race courses sit and hide behind the RCA. Uh, and operate as one. 
Um, we talked a bit about government intervention earlier in the programme. It came up. Um, what can government do or should government do to intervene to make racing's lot better and to make it more fin a, a more financially robust sport and enterprise? I think, you know... I personally don't feel that I think that uh, we missed that opportunity in the autumn. I don't think anything's going to happen. Because the government have come back and said, you're not going to get a yeah. levy. There was and some momentum behind it in the autumn. A look in, you're not going to get a look into um, levy reform in 2021. Yeah, there was some momentum behind it in the autumn. and. Um, so, so, how, so how has the momentum stopped? It wasn't in the interests of certain people. For go on, time. go on. Well. I've only got five minutes left, so don't be opaque. OK. Uh, I think we, we could have gone to government in the autumn. I don't think the race courses or the outgoing chief executive felt that it suited their purposes best. OK, so, but the outgoing chief executive, who again is Nick Rust, and you've, that's about the fourth crack you've had at him. But he is no longer there at, at, the, head of the, at the head of the BHA. So what do the, what do the current executives now have to do to, to drive this forward, to get their voice heard more effectively by government? I think we need to have self-help, myself. Okay. I think we need, to, we need to forget about what... The government might so or might not forget not about do. levy reform, turnover based model. No, not forget Ca about it. Capturing capturing money from foreign racing. Forget about it is is the wrong way of putting it. I but apologize. not prioritize it. No, keep prioritizing, keep pushing, keep trying to make it happen. But we can't bank on that happening. Mm -hmm. And we've got to We've got to, we've got to uh, as I say, I think the redistribution of funds from the levy is a way of helping our own. OK, so it's just it's, it, redistributing what we've got. Yeah. But the pot isn't big enough. No. So how do we grow the pot? Well, what you do is you give, you know, the, the, the levy board is the horseman's money. Mm -hmm. It doesn't belong to the race courses. You know, we produced it. So what you do is you, 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 for, you, no, the you sport, negotiate. The sport produced it, surely. You negotiate. Well, from people betting on it. The race yeah. course is the theatre. Yeah. You're the people. We've you're had this you're the actors on the stage. Yeah. You yeah. all, you all contribute. Yeah, we've had this discussion, Nick, though, haven't we? Um, in the past, my view is that what you do is you is you uh, distribute, as I said earlier, levy funds in a way that um, incentivizes the race courses to increase their executive contributions from media rights. That's my view. That's one, one way of doing it. I would also say that there needs to be an audit somewhere done on how much they're getting in media rights and incentivise them to, uh, to share some of that with the horsemen. I think that that will happen because sooner or later, as I said, you know, the horse population will, will, will ensure that happens because, like we're see already seeing, mm. races aren't filling. Somewhere in the last half an hour, and I know you're concerned, there, are, there, there is some optimism, I think, yeah. somewhere. Oh, yeah, I, I am, within, within I, you. You know, I'm always an optimist, optimist, and I think that there is stuff that can be done. To be continued. Rafe, thank you very much. Thanks, Nick. Thank you very uh, much. Rafe Beckett, um, who I always enjoy chatting to and listening to uh, on this programme. Subscribe to Racing TV to be notified when more Luck on Sunday videos are appearing online. And don't forget to join me for the show every Sunday morning from 9 o'clock with the best guests.